Right, so I think generally we need to look at the causes of casualization, and I don't think these can be tackled overnight. They didn't appear overnight. I don't think there's a uh, an easy answer to this. Uh, ultimately, I think long term we, we need a reshaping of post sixteen education. I think most people here would agree with that. Um, and also, if you look across society, we've got the emergence of the gig economy, and that hasn't happened overnight. But specifically, within um, I think new, within universities, in particular over the summer, it, it's going to be down to the union, to the members, um, and, and you know, support from students and the wider community. I think you need to be, we know we know it's coming. You know, we were there uh, last year, so I think the, the union needs to sort of, uh, step up make it a priority, campaign around it, get students behind it, get the public behind it, short term. And it has to be campaign work. Long term, I think we, we need to start looking at institutionally, what can we change um, at societal level? It's a false economy. Casualization ultimately does not pay. People, it doesn't pay um, for the NHS, for example, it doesn't pay for, as a society, we don't benefit from it. I think we need to start looking at it but it's sort of holistic terms as well. Uh, we've got to create a contract opportunity. I think it's something we need to. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't uh, exist in FE, but at universities, yes. Within FE specifically, the difference between a FE lecturer and a school teacher is nine thousand pounds, and that's increasing. So in FE, we've had a pay freeze, uh, and also casualization in. In FE, in some places, is is, is quite high. Um, what success story I can relate to you is um, just before Christmas at my college, we we did agree that there would be no compulsory redundancies for the next two years. So that was and also all hourly paid staff got a three point one percent pay rise. So there are wins; they're small, but they are happening, and I think we can build on those. Thank you. Thank you, Dom. Um, so I'll bring in the two anti-CAS candidates next. So how do we protect jobs and what's the position on specific demands, for example, the corona contract demands? Um, I think, Sam, you should come in first this time. Um, so Sam Warcroft, over to you. Yeah, so it's a really, really good point. Uh, and actually, at uh, our online interim congress on Saturday, uh, I moved a motion calling on the union to do research on the job losses we sustained in HE and to look at FE as well. Um, and a big part of that was so that we can get a picture of what happened, which we don't really have, and prepare for this summer because student numbers are gonna be very unpredictable again and we might face exactly the same kind of situation again. And that's one of the problems there is the invisible nature of casualization, right? Um, you know, with a fixed term contract, um, you are technically entitled to some redundancy pay and, you know, a redundancy process, but often branches aren't aware of that. Often members aren't aware of that. They just go on well, my contract service. So that's it. I'm done. Uh, we can do more a challenge on that. Um, but then with hourly paid work, you know, I mean, it's the same for me, like not even every year, every six months, I'm like, have I got teaching for the next six months? Um, and that's, that's a real weakness. It's a real problem. Um, so we need to be prepared uh, to fight that in the summer. I think we need to uh, be aware that we may not, uh, uh, on all cases, be able to use strike action as a tactic, but we can use it in some cases um, to protect job losses. Um, but we need to look for other forms of leverage as well, like shaming campaigns, like um, uh, uh, um, uh, any forms of action that will work in local branches. And we need, we need massive support um, from the National Union to do that. Um, on Corona contracts, I mean, I think, you know, that situation we faced in the summer and, and what we might face again this summer um, is, uh, you know, just really shows why the two year, uh, two year uh, minimum contract length uh, demand that Corona contract embodied um, was so important. Um, it just really underlines, you know, that we need job security and longer. And I just really quickly want to say, uh, I haven't been as directly involved in pandemic PGRs, but I have given them some assistance, raised their issues on anti cas committee, et cetera. And I think it's a really important campaign. Uh, sorry, can you please wrap it up? Thanks. Yeah. Cheers, Sam. Um, short time, straight over to Ben. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm really grateful to the work that pandemic PGRs have been doing. Um, and over the summer, I was involved with a anti precarity group in Manchester 
which were making very similar demands to Corona contract um, in terms of um, the in that pandemic situation, we simply needed extensions to contracts. Um, there was no other solution. And uh, so that's so as we were kind of in agreement there, it's obvious that um, I think um, I'm now taking a different line from the line that's currently being advocated by Corona contract um, in terms of um, my approach, which I've outlined here, which is all about trying to drive the use of permanent contracts um, on a much greater scale um, in place of current um, temporary contract arrangements. Um, and um, I, well, to, to respond to some points that Sam made earlier on that, um, I quite appreciate, of course, that the, the compensation to which we are entitled for the temporary nature of our employment is not in itself what we want. I simply believe that this is the best way to drive the use of um, permanent contracts on a large scale without um, serious uh, negative unintended consequences. So that's, uh, that's the, the heart of my approach, really. And um, casualization is obviously an ongoing emergency. We have this loss of jobs, particularly in the summer, but all year round, every year. Um, and we have to develop a, um, a really substantive anti-precarity campaign as part of UCU uh, for um, postdoctoral academic and personal um, professional services staff um, to complement the um, new PGRs as staff campaign, which I really support, and which is obviously a massive kind of um, big picture campaign. Um, and we need um, something else for, for other types of um, higher education staff uh, to complement that um, going into our next major dispute on this issue, which will come undoubtedly. So we need to have a, a good um, solid campaign ready for the future. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the candidates response on this so far. I'm going to bring in Alan Barker next because you indicated that you needed to leave slightly early and then I'll bring in Emma, Rhiannon and then David. Um, Alan, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much. And, and sorry, I'll, I'll just have to leave at, at half past five. I'd love to stay longer because it's a very interesting discussion. A um, little bit scattergun this because um, there's a, a number of kind of key points. Um, I do very much support the, the motion that Sam put to Congress. I think that would be a very important for, first step. And I, ho I hope that becomes policy. Um, I do want to say, though, that I have heard, even from UCU members, um, this assertion that there are that most people, many people on casualised contracts are on them because they want to be on them. Um, that they prefer the kind of flexibility of being on a casualised contract. Utter rubbish, ab absolute rubbish. And we, we really need to, to scotch that idea among many of our own members. And that's, that's, the, that's the first point, you know, it sometimes begins at home, doesn't it? We have to educate our, our, own, um, our own people first. But we also need, I think, to educate the public on what's going on here, because whenever I tell people about the scale of um, casualised work in, in further and higher education, the initial reaction is simply not to believe me. But that can't possibly be the case, that universities operate with, with that many people on, on casualised contracts. So if, if we can do a bit of work on that, I, th I think that would be quite helpful. Um, as always, um, the key to it is going to be strengthening our, in our organisation. And I think it's quite important, it, they haven't got time to really go into this, but it's important that, that we don't sort of disentangle this from other issues. So when we're fighting on a lot of other fronts, we're also fighting on this one. And a lot of these things are really interlinked in quite complicated ways. So we should never just think that we're going to fight on one issue and kind of ignore everything else because this is more important. Fighting on everything at the same time actually re reinforces and, and, and help, helps with all of the others. But the final point is that we really do not want to go back to business as usual um, after the pandemic. I think that's a really important point. We've got to campaign um, with political parties, with our allies, to make sure that we don't. Fantastic, exactly the time. Um, straight over to Emma, if you're okay to come in next, Emma. James, you've been holding me back this entire time. Oh, sorry. Care, sorry, Canadian humor. I don't know if that translates to anybody else. Please don't transcribe me. Um, this is an issue really close to my heart and it's close to my heart and my brain. Um, since 
stepping into the role of vice chair at Leicester UCU, which I recently had to step back from because of losing my job due to an end of contract, one of the key things that I was working on uh, and helping to lead on, as much as you can say that in our beautiful collective organizations, was anti-precarity and anti-casualization. One area where, I, and I think one of the things we need to do is we need to transfer some of the lessons learned at institutions uh, and spread them to others. So there's two real things that I wanna talk about when it comes to precarity and casualization. Number one, we have to get people on better contracts, something that has worked at Leicester, and this was begun uh, by our fabulous chair, and I've had the pleasure of working on this as well, is getting people off of Unitemps contracts. So the universities, especially through the Midlands, because it's it's Warwick and Leicester and Loughborough, and uh, you know this is a, this is a Midlands problem that we're using a subsidiary to pay people, which is how Leicester sacked almost three thousand three hundred people. Sorry, I want to say three thousand three hundred people last March with zero problem on their end. We have to get people off those contracts, and that is working at Leicester, so I know it's possible. One of the roles of a representative at the regional level uh, for our union, I think, is to help translate and, and do the carrying work between branches to help spread this kind of innovation. Um, and I know other places are working on it too, but we've got models that work. And the university is happier as well, because if people are on proper contracts directly through the university, you can't drop them the same way when they work through a subsidiary. That has been an important part of working to reduce precarity and casualization. So we need to get, we, we can do things like getting people onto different contracts. We can do things that are incremental, but powerful, make an immediate difference in workers' lives. But the second thing is a culture change. Now, a culture change has been mentioned with respect to the public or the employers. I gotta tell you, our members are absolutely implicated in this. One of the biggest challenges is we are a vertical union and the folks who do really well off of research grants and buying in help to do the work that is going to get them promotion. That is all built on this kind of casualization. I'm gonna storm you for one quick second. We need to work with our membership. We need to work with our employers and granting agencies because this is a systemic issue and we need to work on the next generation. We need to bring on the PGRs now yeah, into sorry, the union please wrap it up. show them they're Thanks. valuable. Brilliant. <laughs> so sorry to cut you off, Emma. Um, I think you were, you, you, were, you, were, you were done there, weren't you? Um, brilliant. So thanks for keeping time and uh, straight on to Rhiannon and then uh, David. Thanks, James. And um, yeah, I think democracy and building fighting unions are key to how we tackle uh, casualization because to, to win on casualization we have to be prepared to fight and to be prepared to fight we need proper democratic functions within our unions to get members together meeting casualized members space for those exchanges to happen and for debate and for voting all that sort of stuff on my 20s i was a temp in the nhs before i came into fe so i've got some experience of casualization but i believe i should be led uh, as a permanent member of staff by our democratic structures the anti-cas committee and anti-cas reps within branches and so on uh, I do support the Corona contract demands and um, if it came to a vote I would support casualisation being left within industrial strategy rather than being separated out as there was an attempt to do during the last big HE dispute. Uh, I celebrate the work that Elio, Darminder and other people have done in West Midlands region building anti-CAS networks and as a Midlands rep I would definitely be looking to support the building back of these structures to amplify casualised workers are often unable to participate in their branches because of the way they're treated by branch leadership, and, um, not branch leadership, sorry, university leadership, uh, and by the, the fact that everybody is so overwhelmed by work that there is such a lack of connection. I think that a regional rep has a real job to do within the region in building those anti-CAS democratic structures to get people interconnected with other casualised activists, but with their branches helping them make those links because sometimes it's not always that easy. And yeah, absolutely building solidarity and democracy and fighting back, I think, are key to how we tackle all of this. Brilliant, really concise. Thank you, Rhiannon. Um, David, are you okay to come in on those sort of same two points? Sure. Um, so I think there are three questions sort of packed into here around the question of anti casualization There's the what question, there's the how, and there's who. Um, and I think there's problems in the way that Petter has actually posed the question. So I'm, I'm reading, I don't remember a reading from the chat. What will the anti-casualization candidates in brackets and others do to ensure that precarious staff don't face the same jobs massacre this summer that we went through in 2020? So it's why, you know, why, why are the rest of us only in brackets? Because this is a collective problem for all of the union and it has to be. This is not just a job for people on a struggle for people on casualized contracts and in terms of 
you know, people on NEC being able to do anything really, well, we can do lots, but to ensure we, we don't we don't have the power here. And this kind of goes back to something else Petter said in an earlier question about the union did nothing. Who is the union? The union is not a bunch of people who normally work in Carlo Street or normally work in your regional office. We are the union. So the question is, what are we doing to end casual, casualized contracts? So that's that's kind of that's the that's where we need to be starting. Um, in terms of the what and the specific question about the demands of Corona contract, I mean, if you if if we're going to demand something, why don't we demand something good? I mean, why minimum of two year contracts? Why don't we demand an end to casualized contracts? Full stop. We need to have much higher horizons than simply saying it contract should be a minimum of two years and in terms of the how this is you know how we pose these demands and I think this is why this is why Ben's proposals are, are interesting because the question is how do we shift risk from us from workers onto them the employer or, or capital if you want to use Marxist terminology which I'm quite happy to do so it's, it's a quite you know that's why Ben's proposal is interesting because it talks about shifting this risk and what we need is a way of going back to what Emma said about the the vertical nature of university of the hierarchy it's how can we connect the people who are on precarious contracts to people at the top so we're all in the same struggle yeah.